how are you doing? Good, how are you? Doing really good. I'm so excited to be talking with you today. Oh, you got a reanimator key. <laughs> I got a bit of a theme going on here. Yeah. You got all your all your all your merch out. <laughs> yeah, the VHF tapes, books, the DVDs. I even got uh Necronomicon and the Honey I Trump the Kids movies as well. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Those I have had longer than I did with the reanimator movies. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, 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 well, Necronomicon is pretty hard. I mean, Reanimator is much more. <laughs> uh, I couldn't believe I found it. I just found it on tape last week at a thrift store of all places. Where? Necronomicon. I found it at a thrift store of all yeah, places. Yeah, I mean, it was never really released much here. You know, it was financed by um, Japanese and French. And um, in the US, it was sold to New Line. And they didn't give a theatrical release, and uh, they never really pushed it. You know? Oh my gosh, I had no idea. Yeah, it's too bad because, I mean, it's not, it's not a great movie, but certainly for horror fans, and especially today for the horror fans who seem to have this retro um, kind of appreciation of '80s and '90s stuff. You know, I guess the kind of person stuff. I am. Yeah, I think that Necronomicon is, most people don't know about it, but I think it's a, a lot of fun, you know. I've only discovered it in the last few months, only because I started watching the Reanimator movies for the first time. So I'm kind of introducing myself to all these H.P. Uh, Lovecraft stories and other horror movies from the 80s that mm -hmm. are the, your cast was in and the other works that you've done. Mm -hmm. So far, I got quite the collection building up. And there you go. You, it looks like you've got um, VHSs there. No, yeah, they all, they're all DVDs. Well, these are only the DVDs I have. Right, all right. Reanimator, Blu-ray, and DVD. Uh -huh. Right. And I got them all on VHS as well. Oh, there's the yeah. Now, those are the. Eventually, they'll be the collector's items, right? The VHS. For me, it already is. <laughs> it's been very hard to find them. Yeah. I got a Herbert West action figure, a couple of books. Oh, great, great. You got the action figure. <laughs> this is actually really hard to find. <laughs> is it? Yeah. It's either I, hit I, or miss when you go to certain stores, but I had to find it online. Yeah. Well, I, who put that out? Um, uh, NECA. Yeah, yeah. I think you just have to go online. I think, I think well, most of this stuff is good. only online. You're not going to go to you know the toy store or target to get it yeah well yeah. some people found it at a target but really? i don't have any luck in my area i could only i could only wish for that <laughs> and the other thing i have here that i wanted to show you is a painting i did oh oh nice very good i'm pretty sure jeff saw it on twitter too so that was awesome yeah. <laughs> It almost looks ghostly there. Really? <laughs> well, it's kind of like the way the hill hands are coming out of the dark. <laughs> it kind of does. That's kind of the style I was going for when I was painting it, but that's the biggest piece I've ever worked on. Nice. Um, so you practically started your movie career as a producer for like Reanimator from Beyond and a few others from the... Uh, mid to late 80s with Stuart Gordon. Uh, you also worked on uh, Honey, I Trent the Kids and his sequels. How did you become involved in working for films? Um, well, I never planned to because I, when I grew up, everybody wanted to be a novelist. So in the 60s, believe it or not, Time Magazine did a survey of college seniors or I think college seniors and asked them what their great ambition would be. And the great ambition was to be, to write the great American novel, which today would be like crazy. You know, maybe today everybody wants to be a movie director or maybe make the great video game, except that, except that movies are attributed to the director uh, not, I, I think that's a, not quite fair, but they are. It's kind of like we look for 
an author and movies really aren't authored by one person, but we tend to look at the director to get credit and novels are definitely one person. But video games, nobody really knows <laughs> who to give credit to for a video game. So today, everybody wants to be a movie director. Uh, when I was in high school in the 60s, um, it wasn't, you didn't think of that as an option. I mean, I, I guess if you grew up in LA and your, your family was in the movies, you would. But in general, I... I you know, I loved movies, like I think all kids do, but I don't think that, I never thought that it was a, really an option. And plus, I went to college in the late 60s, which was the great, you know, the whole, the whole political youth uprising and the hippies. So I became a hippie. And then, you know, hippies were supposed to turn on, tune in, and drop out. So I did that. But what happened was the revolution didn't come. And so then you had to eventually get a job. Right. And at that point, I just started doing all kinds of jobs. I started doing carpentry. Then I built houses and tried to do some real estate. I painted pictures. I had an art supply store. I invested in a restaurant. I tried a lot of things just to make money. And I, I kind of, um, I made money and I gathered up some money and then I had enough money and I thought, what do I want to do with it? And the, um, and at that time, the video machines just came out and I, I had my first Betamax and I could, rec I, re I remember I recorded a couple of movies and for the first time I could watch them. I mean, when I was a kid, I thought actors made up their own lines, you know. <laughs> I, knew no, I had no idea how movies were made, right? I didn't know somebody had to write them and, you know. And, um, and so I recorded a couple of movies and was able to walk, like go forward, go backwards, which at that time was like crazy, you know? You could just watch what you wanted. One of them was Stanley Kubrick's The Killing, and the other was called The Spiral Staircase with Dorothy McGuire, um, a thriller. And all of a sudden, for the first time, I was able to understand that movies were made up of shots. Because whenever I'd see movies, it was just going by, you know? I'd, I'd sit as close as I could in the movie theater and wow, you know? And so you didn't get to control it and you got swept up in it. So all of a sudden I realized that, wow. I mean, I knew, I mean, I think intellectually I knew that from reading I'd done, but then I decided I ended up with a, 16 millimeter Bolex movie per, um, camera. Because in the 70s, all independent, like the TV stations recorded all the news on these little Bolexes. They were wind up, no battery. They would run for a hundred feet of film and they, and they would then go out in the streets. That was the way to go out and record news. And, but they'd have to, develop it, put it on TV later. Well, in the 70s, along with the, the, um, the, um, the videotape machines, they started having video cameras. Today, the quality would be just ridiculously bad. But at the time, all the TV stations started Turn, getting rid of their 16 millimeter Bolex cameras, 16, and they started getting videotape cameras because the videotape cameras, you didn't have to develop, it was right there. And so they were dumping these things and I ended up with one. And I thought, well, I'm gonna try to make a movie. So I got a bunch of books to read because back then there's no internet, you know, you, you just went to the library or you bought books and to see how you made a movie. 
And I put an ad in the newspaper. I lived in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, which is a college town for the University of North Carolina. And I put an ad in the, in the paper asking for someone to help me make a movie. And I, a guy answered and said, hey, I'm on unemployment, but I went to the, I graduated um, from school in not movies, but radio, television, and motion pictures. You see, they didn't even have a film department. It was radio, television, and motion pictures. And so he came and helped me and we made a short film. And I got really, I got really, um, I got really enthusiastic about it. It just seemed like a, the, the whole process seemed like a lot of fun. Well, I thought the movie was just wonderful. Of course, you had to go to the lab and you had to do a mix. Everybody had to be professional with this involved. And I put it on a VHS tape and took it to show to my friends. And um, for the first time, I realized it was really bad. <laughs> because until then, I thought it was wonderful. I, I, I was enamored of the process and the images. But until I saw it with somebody else, and these were people who really wanted to support me. They didn't say it was bad, but you could tell even just watching. And so of course, like an idiot, I decided that I would, um, I would um, instead of like starting over, I'd extend it into a feature. <laughs> so then I started writing a, a scene, then the next weekend, we'd shoot the scene. The next week, we would edit the scene. And we, we did it till we had about 70 minutes. And by that time, I was reading these movie magazines. And I tried giving, found somebody to try to sell it at the film markets. And I, you know, the, the movie was not good, let's put it. It's an amateur. It was an amateur. It's like a student film. And um, it was called Self-Portrait and Brains. It's about an artist who puts dynamite in his mouth and blows his brains against a canvas for art, right? He comes back as a hologram. And so then that made me kind of, I realized, you know, I really want to do this. But back then, and we're talking early 80s, nobody in North Carolina would make movies. In fact, you know, the problem with making these amateur movies is nobody will show up. You can, you can set a time, but someone will say, oh, I got to go see, help my grandmother, or, you know, <laughs> and they don't show up. So I thought, well, I want to do this. This time I'm going to try to do it professionally, and I'll find a professional director. So I put a little ad in Weekly Variety, um, which is the trade newspaper in Hollywood, asked, looking for a horror movie director. And I got hundreds of, of letters because there's no, this is before internet, no email, no fax machines. You just get letters, you know? And so then I bought a ticket and went out to LA to meet some of the people that had sent me letters. And through that, I found someone who kind of introduced me to the world of independent movies in LA. And by 1985, I'd moved out there. And at the end of 95, we shot Reanimate. So that was how you met Stuart Gordon? Well, the guy who showed me around LA is a guy named Bob Greenberg. He was from Chicago. And the first movie, I, I was, you have to understand, I was not very, I, I was not just naive, but I very distorted in my idea of reality of what the market was like because the movie I wanted to make when I came out to LA was based on a comic book, an underground comic book by Kim Deitch. And it was about uh, a um, prisoner who was electrocuted and reincarnated as the most famous potato in the world. So you can, I thought that would be a big, a, a real crowd pleaser. So you can see how, how, you know, kind of befuddled I was <laughs> to think that, but just because I loved it, I thought, well, everybody's going to love it. Right? But in any case, Bob Greenberg at one point 
told me that I should meet Stuart Gordon. I was looking for a director. He showed, he's the first one that brought me to actual movie sets, um, introduced me to people in Hollywood. But he went to USC, which was one of the main film schools at that time. And so he, and he could knew, had some connections on studio lots. And he kind of explained to me, he's the one that showed me what the independent movie scene was in LA. And I, you know, when I had first asked someone back in North Carolina, um, I, I, I met someone who had been in Hollywood, you know, so we went and he was an old man, probably not as old as I am now. And we went and kind of, you know, oh, Hollywood, what's it like? And he said, hookers and thieves, hookers and thieves. So, but when I went to LA, because everybody hates LA that doesn't live there, right? right. And, um, but when I went to LA, I found everybody was like me. It was all these people from other parts of the country that wanted to make movies. So they went to LA and so you kind of go, wow, this, is, this isn't at all what I expected. Of course, I wasn't trying to get into the studio system. I had no idea what that even was. I, I had, all I knew was I, I thought, well, if you could make money, if you could make your living making movies, that seems like much better than a lot of things you could do. That, that was basic. I had no understanding outside of that. Well, Bob Greenberg took me around and showed me and and I thought, wow, you can, and, and when I first went to the film markets, I realized, wow, they, you make a movie, you take it to the market, you sell it to all these different countries, and you get your money back with a profit, and you do it again. And I thought, no, I understand that. And, um, and I liked horror movies, so I just wanted to, so it wasn't like I was trying to make art movies. I, I wanted to make exploitation movies, because that's what I like. I just like I just like horror my whole life, and and I wanted to have an audience. I was I didn't want to. I wanted to have people look at it. So Bob told me I should meet Stuart Gordon, who was the director of a theater in Chicago called the Organic Theater, and he knew Stuart. And he said, well, "You got to meet him. I think you guys get along." So I went out to Chicago on the. I think it was Easter weekend of 1983 and, um, and met Stewart. I went to the theater, he, had, he was the artistic director and I went and saw a couple of his plays and I really loved his attitude. And one of the plays he took questions afterwards because it was a play in development and people, were very honest about what they liked or didn't like. And Stuart never wavered. He just took notes. He didn't try to defend, say, no, no, you don't understand. He just was trying to make the, the, the play better. And he'd been, he had gone to school in theater and he had been directing theater for 10 years already. He was a professional. And he worked with had worked with some actors who were now starting to make it in in Hollywood. So I went to his house and had dinner there and said, "Hey, let's make a. I want to make a horror movie." And he had a script already for a TV pilot. Now this is back when TV was ABC, NBC, or CBS. It wasn't there wasn't any none of this cable stuff. There were and um, I said, well, I, and it was a reanimate. It was a 60 pages. Uh, it basically what it was what in the movie, the first act of the movie, but there wasn't any Dr. Hill. There wasn't the villain Dr. Hill. And, um, and so I said, oh, I love the idea of this. It's a mad doctor, right? And I like that kind of thing, dead people walking. And, um, but I said, I want to do a movie, not a TV show. So let's develop it into a movie. And so one year later, believe it or not, um, we began on the, the Monday after th Thanksgiving in 1985, we began shooting Reanimate. So it worked that fast. 
Wow. That is crazy fast. I never expected something to go through that quickly just to get approved and be able to be made. Oh, get approved. No, it wasn't getting approved. You understand. I wrote, I borrowed the money to pay for it. I didn't, I didn't ask anybody to do it. I just borrowed the money and I took what money I had and I paid for it. And I, I paid the bills and I was, I was the, I didn't have to answer to anybody. So it was, it was the money in the bank. Investment. <laughs> Uh, well, it was, except that actually, actually, I suffered the the, the um, experience that many people going to Hollywood that want to get into movies have, which is that the companies out there will take you for a ride. They'll fleece you. And that happened to me. If, it, if, if I hadn't, I made a bad, I mean, I had to, after making Reanimator, I spent two and a half years in a lot of money in a lawsuit to get the movie back because I gave it to the wrong I gave it to the wrong company Empire Pictures oh, no. to sell and distribute and of course they didn't give me a nickel I and so the, movie, no <laughs> so the movie if I had if they had paid me what I should have gotten I would have made millions on that just because that movie who could have guessed that a cheap horror movie would be so successful well, the only reason it was was because Stewart was already a, an accomplished director. He just had never done film. And he was a huge horror fan, and he liked to shock people. He liked to be shocking. And I am a horror fan, and I was paying for it, so I was all in for going full bore over the top with it. So as Stewart used to say, um, that he and I brought out the worst in each other. <laughs> and you mentioned being uh, quite a bit of a horror fan and I, I'm a horror fan myself. Um, what is it about horror movies that you like so much? I don't know, you know, I like, um, I like not just horror, but I like the weird. I like in art, I like surrealism and expressionism. I like, and I like surrealism because it's kind of chain of, of consciousness. It's sort of like, you know, there's the logic is more poetic than it is. It's not logical. I like legends and myths and when I grew up fairy tales. And also part of it is I, I have a theory that some people when almost everybody likes horror when they're adolescent during puberty, uh, horror really speaks to people because they first become aware of sex and death, which both are kind of this on uh, different sides of the same coin. And, the, and also there's body changes. So you can understand a werewolf. <laughs> you can, you, you know, I think it really works for people, people in adolescence. Normally we grow out of that. And we, and we get older and then horror to us is paying the mortgage, you know, keeping a job. But there's some people who like horror their whole lives. And I'm one of them. And I have a theory and maybe wrong that you, that you have to have been infected early on <laughs> to yeah, like I would have. <laughs> that, that, I was in like early junior high school when I started watching the classic, um, 80s horror like uh, the Chucky or uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. That was kind of my start of horror movies for me. Well, Nightmare on Elm Street was pretty good. I remember when I first saw it. It was it delivered. Well, I saw a movie when I was about five or six years old. I lived in Panama in Central America. We didn't have television, but on Sundays we'd go to the kids' movie show, and. Um, at the kids' movie show one time, they showed the creature with the atom brain. Well, that's not a great movie, but it's a zombie movie. And it scared me. I couldn't sleep for nights, you know, as a little kid and um, had nightmares, you know. And I think the next one that did that to me was The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, the Ray Harryhausen movie. So I think it, it, the, the horror of that somehow 
in a way, it's kind of like what people say about drugs. It, you know, at first, you know, it makes you sick. And after a while, you're chasing the dragon, you know, that at first it made me sick to watch horror. But by the time I got to be in, uh, in middle school, I just loved horror. I saw it as an entertainer. You know, it's kind of like, it's really scary and terrible to go speeding in a car on curvy roads in the mountain. You could die, it's the vertigo. But if you go to a theme park and go on the roller coaster, you can have that same feeling of that thrill of fear, but it's safe. And a horror movie get, lets you kind of be afraid and deal with, with real things, you know, with the decay of the body, with life and death, with sex and violence, all these things that are, that are um, real and uncomfortable and horrific, but you're doing it in an entertaining way. So there's a whole, there's a whole distance to it. And like Stuart Gordon used to say, when they'd say, why do you make such, why do you make horror movies? It's just because I think horror should be up on the screen where it belongs and not in our life, you know? So there's, there's, there's kind of that, you know, the idea that um, it's a way to deal with stuff that, um, that you wouldn't want to deal with in real life. A lot of people do enjoy a good scare once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, I actually recently watched a movie for the first time that literally frightened me, and that's something that never really happens. It was uh, House on Haunted Hill from 1999. Uh, Jeff oh, 99 one. Yeah. Yeah, it, I had such chills and many jump scenes, so <laughs> that was the one movie that definitely affected me recently, but uh, I got well, I, I, I really loved the first one. Uh, House on Hill from the 50s was the first horror movie haunted house movie that I saw where I just purely enjoyed it. It, I, it was scary, but I was on top of it. I actually have the DVD right here. I just picked it up from the library, the original movie, so I can yeah, finally have the chance to watch well, that. It's, I think it's hard for, for viewers today to understand those old movies. It's, I, I always think that, I think when I first saw the Universal Horror movies, mm -hmm. Um, the Frankenstein ones. It was in the early 60s on television. Of course, I had already seen some Hammer movies, which were pretty tough. Um, but the point I'm making is then these Frankenstein and Dracula movies were 30 years old. They were old. They were black and white. They were old movies. Well, today, if somebody watches Reanimator, Reanimator's more than 30 years old. Yeah. It's 40 years, it's 40, I think, right? 85, one, two, three, almost 40 years old. <laughs> so you think about that and you go, that's like 40 years old when I first saw Frankenstein. That's silent movies for me. I would have 40 years, when I was an adolescent, 40 years ago, it was silent films. And so you really, I mean, it really is amazing that, that um, viewers today are so interested in the 80s movies because yeah. they're 30 years old. They're so old. It's so different. You know, the technology, the style of acting, the style of telling a story. I, I mean, I'm glad because I made movies. Oh, I love history. it. I prefer yeah. the 80s horror more than I do modern day telling. Um, I'm 24 years old and I'm so retro for my age that I prefer older movies than newer stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, why do you do that? I think that's the question. You know, why is it more attractive to you? Maybe it's because they don't work as well. You don't want to watch the new ones that maybe kind of are, are too immediate. Well, it's not just horror movies per se, it's other things, the pop cultures that I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly from like the 70s, 80s, and 90s. I prefer those era of things than I do uh, current-wise. Mm -hmm. um, so pretty much all of your movies um, have a theme going on with like uh, mutations and operations, dentists, uh, mass scientists, and deformities. 
is having those type type of characters something you love in a horror story? I think that I like, I think a lot of times we, when we make movies, or if, if you write a story or you um, compose a song, you tend to base it on something that was just familiar with you. You don't, you, 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 you're inspired. And I think that when I started making horror movies, I wanted to be like the horror movies I liked when I was 12 years old or, or earlier. I, you know, I wanted to make movies the way Roger Corman's Edgar Allan Poe series were. I wanted the things that, that impressed me. I actually, before I saw horror movies, when I was just, when I could first buy a comic book, the first comic books I bought were horror comics. And they really freaked me out. They were real kind of disturbing, but they were like EC comics. There, there was always everybody, there's always a head getting cut off and somebody wanting to eat brains or something. And so you tended, and I liked Mad Magazine, which was satirical. And so I tended to just want to do stuff that I had liked in the past. And I think the the horror that I made, I think Reanimator, for example, is actually retro for the time. I agree. 85, and yet we were making something that we loved. We were just doing it in a modern day, but it was, I mean, it's totally wacky. It just happens to be really good. And most, most cheap horror movies just aren't that well made. And I attribute that to... Well, I know that's about to be true, but there's something about... Uh, chiefly made horror movies that can be a, a special thing to fans or other horror fans. Uh, it can gain kind of a cult following that they can uh, uh, be a part of. Yeah, I think that um, that there, like, I know I'm a horror fan. I'm a, I'm a movie fan, so I like all kinds of movies. But if it's a rom com, it's got to be a really good one. If it's you know. It's a drama, it has to be a really good drama. But with the horror movie, I like the bad ones. So I'll watch bad horror movies. And that tells me I'm a horror fan because I'll even watch the bad stuff. I get a great kick out of it. And uh, you and Stuart Gordon were our link to the world of HP Lovecraft with several titles made like uh, Reanimator, From Beyond, Necronomicon, and Gagan. Um, what is it about Lovecraft lore that uh, inspired you to make a movie out of these stories? Well, what inspired me was that Stuart had that script of reanimated. Now, once we made, then I read the, the stories. I'd never read them. Now, the stories, there's six short stories that make up the story of reanimator. It's called Herbert West Reanimator. And these six stories, are um, they're not they're not typical Lovecraft stories. So when people think of Lovecraft, they think of the um, of cosmic horror. And um, Reanimator isn't. Reanimator is kind of like a monkey's paw type of horror movie. It's very old fashioned type of things crawling out of the grave, grisly stuff type of horror movie. It has a mad doctor aspect to it. And um, but. When we, after we made, as we were making it even, we started thinking, well, what will be the next one? And so Stuart said we should do Shadow Over Innsmouth. Well, I started looking into all the Lovecraft stories then. I had read Lovecraft when I was in college, but I didn't like it much because it seemed very wordy and then once the hero saw the monster, he fainted and you didn't get the monster. And so I was not that big into it. But once we were making Reanimator and I started reading, then I started just reading all Lovecraft stories because I thought we'll, we'll follow it up with another Lovecraft story. Then I started really appreciating it. Plus I was a lot older by now, you have to understand I didn't make Reanimator until I was in my early 30s. I didn't even 
think about making movies until I was about 30 years old. It didn't even occur to me that I could do that. So I didn't start making movies when I was 18 or 20 years old, the way people do now. I, I was already kind of grown up. And once I was older, I could read Lovecraft and really appreciate it and really like it. And so then we started figuring out what stories we wanted to do. Immediately, I had Dennis Paoli, one of the writers of Reanimator, write a script based on Shadow of Rinsman, which is arguably the um, maybe the most complete novella by Lovecraft. I think one really it all hangs together beautifully. Um, but I called it Dagon, which is another Lovecraft story about a sea god, which figures into what Shadow of Our Incident. But the reason I did is because I personally didn't think that Dagon, that Shadow of Our Incident was a good title. I thought, what the heck does that mean? It just seemed so sort of vague and wishy-washy. But I thought Dagon sounds like a monster. Sounds like something strong. And so, and so we um, called it Dagon. But that movie didn't get made for about 15 years. I kept it in my, you know, in my, my suitcase. What we did do is we immediately made a deal with the company Empire, which had the distribution rights of Reanimator. This was before they didn't pay. <laughs> before I sued him. Um, so we immediately made, after the screening of Reanimator at the Cannes Film Market in 1985, we made a deal to do three movies with Empire. They would, they would pay for it. I didn't have to pay for it. And I had always heard that a director, his second movie, the sophomoric movie, would be sophomoric, <laughs> that it could be a bad one. That's very typical that a director who makes a great first movie will have a dip, will kind of falter on the second. And so we did a deal where we'd do two movies at once, we'd shoot them back to back. We did it in Rome, Italy. And um, the first one was called Dolls. I don't know if you've seen Dolls. It's about, it's kind of a, a fairy tale one where a, a family in England, um, their car breaks down, of course, right? And they end up in the old doll maker's house and the dolls come to life and, you know, it's all scary and everything. It's like, it's a Hansel and Gretel type story. And then the second one would be From Beyond, which is a Lovecraft story, which we used, but we basically used up the whole Lovecraft story before the title sequence. And then we made up everything else. And that was, we used Barbara Crampton and Jeffrey Combs in that. I think that's a good movie. If you haven't seen it, that's a good one to watch. No, not yet. It's definitely on my list of things I need to watch. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, can, can you hold on for just a second, please? I'm uh, having some trouble with the recording of our interview here. I, I okay. have like a minute left of our recording. And I have no idea what I'm Zoom is doing here. So it's asking me to upgrade. So I'm just going to do that real quick. I apologize. Uh, the paper is now that's not there. <laughs> um, apparently, I had to upgrade Zoom, and I didn't even know that. You have to upgrade Zoom. Yeah, I said I um now have unlimited. Well, now it says it's oh. It's been, oh, because you went over an hour and there's only two people. Yeah, oh, I never had or, that problem. It's not an hour, though. I think you're only at 40 minutes. But they used I, to give you a, they used to give you an hour for two people. Well, and I now I guess you have to, pardon? I've done interviews up to two hours, so I don't know why it's asked me to do this now. Did you have more than two people on the Zoom? Um, yeah, I've had up to four people on the Yeah, Zoom. yeah. If you have more than two people, I think you get to go longer. If it's only two, I think you have to renew it, but you've got it now, right? 
That's so interesting. Well, it's working now, so I paid for it, so that'll be worth it for the future. Oh, you had to pay for it. That's the thing. <laughs> um, I wanted to keep this track going, so I paid for it. There you go. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I, I'm going to continue the questions now, I guess. So um, I know I've heard the name of H.P. Lovecraft over the years, but I did not really know who he was until I saw the reanimator movie. So the Herbert West story was actually the very first Lovecraft story I got to read. And I found it quite fascinating to read for, and it was pretty surreal for a horror story that took place in like the 1920s. Um, what was your first initial thought on the, his style? On Lovecraft's style? Yeah. Well, that story is not typical of his style. That story is kind of, I don't think he cared for that story. I think I got paid for it. It's not one of the stories he wrote on his own because it's a more traditional kind of horror story. The ones that are more Lovecraftian, well, I think Shadow of Rinsmith is very Lovecraftian. Um, I think that my feeling about Lovecraft is he's got an, he, he wrote in the 20s, um, he was very, um, someone who was brought up by his aunts. He, when he was younger, I think he was born in 1880-something, his grandfather had money. So he grew up, when he was very young, they had some, a nice standard of living. But when the grandfather died, they, he ended up being brought up by aunts. And I don't think he was a very social guy. And he basically said, he felt like he should have been born in the 1700s. He felt like someone who was out of his own time. And, um, and I think he tended to write that way a little bit, like it was older. And he wrote what was called amateur fiction back then. And they even, and they had newsletters they would publish. You would, you would send in your story to the newsletter and they had conventions where they would go meet like-minded people. He lived in Providence, Rhode Island. And um, my feeling is, is that if Lovecraft, a modern day Lovecraft would be someone who would be writing for a website like Creepy pasta or something. I don't know if you know that website where people. Oh, yeah. it, it's the website that created the Slender Man. Um, I know Slender Man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that started with Creepy Pasta, and it's basically amateur writers who post their their horror stories, and it's a community. And I think that's kind of what Lovecraft is doing. He could never make a living making writing stuff. He didn't make much money at all. He was always afraid that he was going to end up in a mental hospital because he felt like both his mother and father had. And I think that he, you know, he wrote in kind of an archaic way because he really felt like he was, you know, he was out of his own time. Some people feel that way. They feel like, oh, this isn't the age I should have been born in, you know. So I think that for me, at first, it was difficult to read Lovecraft because I'm a movie kind of guy. And I like things, or comic books first, then movies when I was a kid. I, I read a lot of stuff too. But I think that the thing that's difficult with Lovecraft, he's not like Stephen King, where you read the book, you can see the movie, he writes in images. Lovecraft, the words themselves were the medium. So it's not visual, it's the words, just the way Edgar Allan Poe is. When you read Poe, it's, the, it's you know, back before radio and photography and, and movies, poetry was the highest level of kind of stimulating yourself. And you know, as you well know, Poe, his most famous work is a poem, it's The Raven. Well, that is like a movie back. I mean, the, the Raven is almost like a movie when you read it. It's the, the use of the words evokes 
the feeling, the story. Well, today we don't do it that way. Today we write to bring up an image because we're so visually oriented, you know? I mean, I mean, that's what memes are like that. You can't just say something, you gotta show a little image of it. And I think we've changed, you know, humans, you yeah, know, our I, culture I, has changed. When I first read Lovecraft in the Herbert West story, I actually was a little confused at first because there was no lines, there was no signs of dialogue in the story at all, it's just all words. Yeah, it's all, and it's all, in a, and in a way, what it's trying to do is get you to that point of horror. It's trying to carry you to thinking this could have been true, you know? It's like reading a, um, a ghost story, a good ghost story oh, basically sure. just makes you feel it's kind of like an alien abduction story or something. <laughs> it's a ghosts and aliens are very similar in the sense that if you ever see the ghost, it quits being a ghost story, it starts being a creature story. And alien stories, a UFO story, if you ever actually see the alien, then it becomes a sci-fi story. It's all about getting closer and closer to, oh my God, aliens could be true or ghosts could be, oh my God, what's in the shadows? But with Lovecraft, I think he was just trying to give you that feeling. And so when I was younger, what I didn't like about it was how he would bail out as soon as it got to the climax. We didn't get to see the monster. Right. But of course, when I got older, I realized, no, what he's trying to do was take you up to that point that the protagonist is in and be horrified by, by the horror of this experience. And that's different. Today, we all do it by vision. For, for sure. And I think that's why I kind of enjoy reading modern day stories compared to his work, because I would prefer just going right in with the dialogue and not just words, because I found myself seeing myself, I, I found myself having a hard time getting the story. Yeah, it's, a, it's tough to read. When I was in, in high school, I think, I wrote, I wrote, I read both Bram Stoker's Dracula and um, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And I found Dracula actually quite impressive. I liked Dracula. And it, it was kind of a found, you know, Dracula is kind of a found footage story because it's basically first you have Jonathan Harker's journal where somebody's writing what happened to him as a diary when he's in Dracula's castle. Then you have news clips from the newspapers. You know, everything is done like it was something you found, you know, to try to make it seem more real. But it's a real story and it has a real villain and you kind of get the whole story. With Frankenstein, I hated it. I was so disappointed. I, it was just archaic and clunky and I don't know what. I know. And it was just impossible for me to enjoy it. But later, when I made Bride of Reanimator, I went back and read Frankenstein because I wanted to be, and I knew, you know, Frankenstein, the story, the book, already has the bride in it. So I read Frankenstein, I watched Bride of Frankenstein, I read a book about how James Well developed the Bride of Frankenstein, and um, all of a sudden, I'm in my late mid to late thirties, and I'm I'm reading Frankenstein twenty years after I first did, and I'm entranced by it because now I'm older, and I'm I don't I'm you know clunky boring reading doesn't bother me anymore because I'm old enough to take it right. I'm not young where I want everything to happen right now and, and be just the way I understand it. I can understand it better because I was interested in reading Frankenstein, why an actor like Boris Karloff would even pull his teeth to make his cheeks sink in to be the monster. And I'm going, for that? Why would he do that? But when I, re when I read the book again and the version I read, 
was illustrated by Bernie Wrightson, who we had used to do concept art for Shadow of Rinsman, a brilliant artist. And his line, and they were black and white ink drawings to illustrate the text. And, you know, all of a sudden I was swept by the theme of the book. And the theme was this idea of being created and your creator rejects you. That's the theme of, of the book of Frankenstein to me, which I think we can all understand because we, it's very easy to understand that your parents could reject you. The people who author you can reject you. And in any case that your parents might not wholeheartedly embrace you, you're being rejected. And that rejection from a parent, I mean, it can start with a baby being pushed away from biting the nipple. You know, at one point they say, cut it out. Well, that feeling is a feeling of being rejected by, by the creator. And then there's a whole religious side of it, or I, an existential part of it, which I put into Bride of Reanimator. I made a, a text for Jeffrey Combs to rail against God, where he says, you know, blasphemy in front of what God? You know, he, he rejects the God who rejected us. And the story of Bride of Reanimator, I made that Dan Cain creates you know, this composite woman based on the heart of his, of his lost love. And he sees her as a horror. And she just literally falls apart because it's her. You know, she just falls, but she takes out her heart. Is this what you, and I think that's the theme of Frankenstein. It's that idea of being rejected by by the creator, whether it's God or your parents or, or Dr. Frankenstein. So I think that that, when I was old enough to be able to read text that wasn't, that was kind of archaic, it is archaic for us, um, then I could see what was, um, you know, what what in it was kind of exciting to me. And I think Lovecraft's like that. You've got to, you read a lot of it, you're just, you know, you read a Lovecraft story. Most Lovecraft stories, I could read the story. And after I finish, if you asked me, what was the plot of that story? What happened? I wouldn't be able to tell you. I, just a minute, I think, it, it, you know, it's not plot driven, you know, and I think that's the, you know, it, it but I've read most of them now, I've read most Lovecraft stuff, and um, you, you, you know, you just have to pay attention, you know. Well, I might as well give it a chance again, because I, I don't know, you know, what I do a lot is I will see a movie I like, and then I'll go read the book. <laughs> or these days I do audio books, you know, because then you can do your chores while you right. read the book, right? You just plug it in. Um, so I, I like reading the book of a movie. I like to see the, read the book, the radio play, all the different versions of it, because it helps me understand, because I'm interested in how you adapt, how different mediums um, reflect, tell a story. They're different. A book is different from a movie, is For different sure. from a graphic novel, is different from a radio play. All of them, have, there's a, or is different from a, a, um, a musical comedy. I mean, Pygmalion, and Pygmalion's based on a Greek story, and it became the theatrical um, um, basis for My Fair Lady, the musical. All of them tell the story a little different, you know? And I think that's fascinating, even with, with bigger movies. I'll always try to look at the, the, you know, the underlying story. If you watch From Beyond, for example, then read the story of From Beyond. It'll take, you five, it'll, take you five, 
It'll take you five minutes to read the story from the end, you know, but it'll kind of give you a real idea of what was going on to make that movie. You'll say, oh, so they took this part of it. Did they actually capture the, 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 the story or the tone of it? With Reanimator, some people say, oh, it's not really like the story of Reanimator, because the story of Reanimator took place in the 20s, right, in the teens. And it's different, and there's no, Dr. Hill doesn't really exist. There's a, there's a pilot named Hill, and he does have the head and everything. D Dean Halsey, it, 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 Megan Halsey doesn't exist, because Lovecraft rarely wrote women, and he almost never wrote, there was never like a love story, because he was, I think he was so unsocial, you know, that I don't think he was capable of it. He just was going for the weird. But I think if you watch the movie, then read the read the stories, you'll, you know, you can see how people, at least for me, it's interesting to see how people adapt it. Like if you were going to adapt it, how would you do it? You know, if you right. did, a, I know today podcasts are very popular and people do like, true crime or they do all kinds of stories on podcasts and now i know there's people that, that have even contacted me that say oh i want to do some some we want to do stories on podcasts well i'm someone who grew up with when i was a kid we didn't have television in the 50s where i lived in latin america so i listened to a lot of radio and over the years i listened to a lot of radio drama the old stuff from the 30s 40s and I love it. I love how they tell this. They they take a movie and they take the same actors and do a radio play. Well, today it seems like people are getting back into that a little bit. And so then you have to say, well, what if you wanted to do your on your podcast? You want to do a radio play, uh, audio version. You could take a Lovecraft story and adapt it. How would you do it? I don't know, you know, you would have to make those decisions and say, this is the story I see. How about the creator's decision? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I uh, got a couple more questions, but first I want to give a huge shout out to a group on Facebook called Reanimator Reanimated. Uh, it's a group of Reanimator fans who come together to talk about the franchise. Uh, my This question comes from a friend of mine called named Jeff, and I too have the same question. Um, are there any plans to bring the reanimator or Herbert West back to the screen? Well, I, I have a couple of versions I'm trying to get money for, but for some reason, I, I, I guess I have a hard time doing it for too low a budget because I feel like it would be disappointing. But I have two, two sequels. <laughs> One of them is called Reanimator Unbound, which, um, which is, has the as has Herbert and Dan Kane. And in this version, Herbert West has just been in the White House and gets paid off by um, having this island where he has a, all the equipment he needs and he's making, he's making um, reanimated soldiers for the Black Ops. And he's, he, but he on his own he's still experimenting so he's built himself a particle collider <laughs> so he's and of course he 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 kind of um breaks the space-time continuum and of course it's not it's not good because you know lovecraftian monsters are on the other side that's kind of a bigger one and um the small one is called Reanimator Returns. And basically it's sort of after that happened, West, it's back in Miskatonic. And it's West, it's kind of like from beyond. West is in a padded cell. He's blown his mind. And Gruber's granddaughter, Gruber from the first one, is a brain surgeon or student. And so she goes to deal with West and of course, Mayhem ensues on a smaller level. It's kind of like the level of the first movie. 
That got me very excited. If that ever happened, I told we we see the movie that movie. <laughs> um, so where would you see Herbert West in 2022? Well, After I think that you know, in the third young. one, he was. I, I'm I'm thinking Herbert West as 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 um, Jeffrey Combs. Of course, how can yeah. you not? Um, not to redo him. I'm not talking about a re remake or something. Um, I think he's, you know, well, I put him in, in Sefton Asylum. That's where I put him. <laughs> well, I definitely have to say, Jeffrey is a very, a very great Herbert West, and I don't think anyone else can top that role but Jeffrey. Um, so I got a couple more questions to wrap things up here. Um, uh, what project did you enjoy working on the most? Maybe Reanimator, because it was my first. Oh, because it was my first one. You know, it was like so exciting to be making a movie in Hollywood. You know? I mean, it was just everything was wonderful. I mean, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of stress, and it, but it was just because it was the first. You know, the first one that kind of means a lot. I certainly enjoyed a lot making um, Return to Living Dead Three because that's the movie I think that I've directed that turned out almost exactly the way it was planned. You know, it was what we planned to do and with the story where we actually did pretty much that. I would say that society was just, you know, that was my first movie directing. It was crazy. I just enjoyed it so much. It was, um, and it was kind of very much um, very close to me because it was just weird. <laughs> and it was stuff I just loved to do. And doing the shunting for me was just a delight. It was just delight. I just had the best time doing that, you know. And I know that the special effects for the 1980s were actually really impressive for movies back then. Uh, especially for horror movies. Uh, this was long before CGI, and this, there was a lot of creativity and practical effects. I have to imagine that working with the head of David Gale for Carl Hill uh, had to have been a tricky one to do. Uh, what was it like to um, work with the effects uh, like that in that time frame for movies since it's greatly improved? Well, I was, you have to understand, I was, when I made Reanimator, I was probably the least, um, the least experienced person on the set. But since I was paying for it, I got to learn from everybody. And that's what I did. And that movie kind of taught me about kind of what I call rubber effects. I, I always thought there should be a book called, about Hollywood called The Invasion of the Rubber Guys. About, Holly, about the special effects in the 80s for horror movies. Because all the, and Nightmare on Elm Street, those movies just started being showcases for rubber effects, this foam latex and, you know, all these incredible sculptures and trying to make them move. And, you know, they were puppets basically. So I learned by doing it on Reanimator, uh, a, a guy that, that, um, that Bob Greenberg also in, in introduced me to was named Tony Dublin. So I worked with, I got him to do the effects and he brought on a guy named James Nolan. I had already met, um, 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 what's his name, Beekler, um, who, did a, who's, who did effects for Empire at that time. And he was quite, quite, a, quite accomplished. Well, these effects were a bit clunky but I learned how you did it. And what I learned was that with rubber effects or these kind of practical makeup effects, makeup and mechanical effects without CGI, you have to hide everything, you know, um, that it really is all about just finding an angle that you can shoot it from. <laughs> and I would always say, you know, if it isn't working, just add smoke, goop, and blinking lights. So if you just shoot these kind of rubber effects clean, they look awful. 
But if you put a little smoke in there and then pour some goop over it so it's gooey, and then you blink the lights, it starts, <laughs> you can kind of make it come to life for a little bit. So I think that's kind of, you know, for me, I feel very, I feel very comfortable with the facts. I mean, it's one of the things I love the most about doing horror movies is that you get to create these goofy things that you wouldn't see. Of course. I mean, the, the shunting, my God, who could ever see that, you know? Well, I got one more question. I recently came upon a rumor that there's a Honey, I Shrunk the Kids reboot happening with you involved. Uh, can you comment on that? Well, I don't, I've read about it too. Uh, they have no obligation to me. It's Disney owns it. And um, I, but my understanding that I read was that they, they were gonna use the original script, which would be a great thing because, because then I get a piece of it. <laughs> you created the characters. <laughs> <laughs> you get, well, it was, you know, Stuart and I came up with that idea here in my backyard at a barbecue because we both have kids. We're both family guys, you know. And Stuart said that he thought that we should make a movie our kids could see instead of a horror movie. <laughs> and, he, and so we said, well, let's do something like the old Disney movies of the 50s, like the Shaggy Dog, you know, or the Flubber one, you know. And, um, and then I mentioned that I thought, I said, you know, when I was a little kid, I used to play in the grass with little soldiers and stuff. And it just seemed like if you got down into the grass and imagine being real small, the world, just the backyard was like crazy, dramatic and bugs. And I thought I could, you know, riding an, uh, an ant and riding a bee. And then Stuart immediately said, yeah, well, it's, the kid's father is, an, is, an, is a inventor and he has a shrink ray. And they get shrunk and thrown out in the backyard and the adventure is coming home. It, like the whole adventure is in your backyard, you know. And so that's how, it, that's how it began. And we thought, this has to be a Disney movie. We should put Fred McMurray in it, which didn't happen. But we went and Stuart had a really high-end agent. And they got us a pitch meeting at Disney. And they went for it. Imagine <laughs> Well, it wouldn't have happened without Disney. I mean, the, the franchise is actually a really good set of movies that I grew up watching from my early childhood. I must have seen them like a hundred times and probably the second one even more so. <laughs> oh, the big um, one would be that you want to be the giant one. Right? Yeah, there was something about the Honey, I Blew Up the Kid that made me want to watch that more than the others. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, well, I really do appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today, Brian. It was really, really great. Well, thank you, and please give my regards to the Reanimator Reanimated group. I uh, appreciate them being out there. <laughs> I will. Thank you so much, and I will send you the link as soon as I upload the video. Okay. Thanks a lot. Have a good weekend. Bye bye.